Black woman, black hips, black kiss, black lips, afro with a black pig. Love when you talk that black ish. Black man, black fist. Welcome black to Island. Black grip, black 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 schools, black scholars, black doctors, black black designers, black garments, black stage, black performance, black panel, black audience, black mothers, black fathers, black sons, black daughters, black love, black honor. You black today, you gonna be black tomorrow. Black woman, black hips, black kiss, black lips, afro with a black pig. Love when you talk that black. History is a clock that people use to tell the political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells of people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go and what they still must be. The relationship of history to the people is the same as the relationship of a mother to her child. How do you describe a legend, an African-American hero, an historian, an activist who for half a century has charted a singular course dedicated to the intellectual and spiritual liberation of a people? Though his eyes are now darkened by glaucoma, he continues to enlighten the lives of thousands of men and women through the pages of his many books and in university classrooms across the country. How do you describe a legend? You can't, really. But you can meet the men and women who influenced him. You can learn from him the hidden history of the African people. Learn from him a different way of making sense of this complex and often very confusing world. And you can let Dr. John Henry Clark tell his own extraordinary story in his own soulful style. I was born on a sharecropper farm in Union Springs, Alabama, New Year's Day, 1915. That was a great feast day in our family. And because my mother was a favorite in the family and I was late arriving, she said that nothing would be killed in this family until my child is born. And I didn't arrive until three, and everybody was hungry. The feast had not started, and I wasn't exactly welcome. <laughs> they never quite forgave me for that, holding up the feast. 
My early schooling was in a uh, one-room schoolhouse that we called Miller's Hill School. When we moved slightly out of the city, I was chosen to go to city school. Officially, I never finished high school in the formal sense until later years. In fact, I taught two generations before I took time out to get my BA, my master's, and my PhD. And I have it all now, but uh, I'm principally self-trained. My university was the public library and well-chosen second-hand bookstores. So while I grew up poor, I grew up in a very rich environment, culturally rich. I grew up with a whole lot of love and affection, a lot of lap time, a lot of slap time too, because I wasn't permitted to get away with too much. Miss Evelina Taylor is my fifth grade teacher, and she might be the foundation teacher in my life. In addition to teaching me basic good thinking and good conduct, she called me into her room during her lunch hour one day and told me to stop playing the fool because I was playing the fool just to get accepted. And she said, it is better to be right and march into hell than to follow a bunch of fools into heaven. I wanted to do something to impress Miss Taylor, and we had current events on Friday. We wanted to say something unusual. Because I worked for white people before and after school, and they had magazines, they would receive them one day, read them, hurriedly up, throw them away the next day. So when I got up for current events, I always had something decidedly different to say about my own people and about other people. No, I wanted to do something real, real big. So I went to a lawyer that uh, I worked for before and after school. I can still remember his name, Gag Steider. And I asked him for a book about my people in early world history. He says, I'm sorry, John, that uh, you came from a people who have no history. My mind would not accept that. I continued to search, and I opened a book called The New Negro, and I opened to an essay called The Negro Digs Up His Past. And for the first time, I knew that I came from a very old people, that we were older than slavery, older than oppression, older than Europe. Now the scramble began for more information. During the disaster years of the Great Depression, Americans in huge numbers take to the rails. They don't take Pullman cars or day coaches. They stow away on the freights, riding the rails in search of the opportunity to create a better life. John Henry Clark wrote them. Out of the South first, briefly to Chicago, and then on to New York City. I had a dream, I thought that because I'd had some success in writing local plays, writing lyrics for songs for local plays, and that I can go write professionally. It was a dream, it was a fantasy. I was pursuing this fantasy. At 18, you can pursue all kinds of fantasies. In the shadow of Manhattan's towering skyscrapers lies black, sprawling Harlem, greatest Negro metropolis in the world. My impressions of the Harlem community, in the first place, it was a clean community. It was an orderly community. It was a safe community. 
It was a community with its customs that we have forgotten now. Street speaking customs, strolling customs, social customs. There was a time when 7th Avenue, now Adam Power Boulevard, was the street of choice. And you did not walk down 7th Avenue on Saturday or Sunday without a coat and a tie. There was a custom of getting your lady in your long good suit and walking down 7th Avenue to show her off. You would walk 15 blocks. Sometime when you had a dollar or so to spend, you would take on the 5th Avenue open bus all the way down to New York University and all the way back. And she was satisfied, and the whole evening, you hadn't spent a dollar. A lot of times you didn't have one. They sure don't make ladies like that anymore. There was a time there were three functioning vaudeville theaters in Harlem, all well patronized. The Lafayette, Harlem Opera House, and the Apollo. The old Lincoln Theater, now a church, used to be a legitimate theater where the plays downtown would be brought uptown with them, played with the black cast. Tyrant, show my face. And that was our Broadway. I got involved with the communists and the socialists and other radicals and begin to read literature on the Russia of that day and to see movies about Russia. And I was never a member of the Communist or the Socialist Party. I was active briefly in the Young Communist League. We were looking for a way out of the condition in which we live. And they opened doors for us and gave us a platform we otherwise did not have. Paul Robeson was the one artist who made the great sacrifice based on commitment. And that commitment is that an artist supposed to use his or her art to change the society in which they live. W.E.B. Du Bois is our greatest single intellect we produced in the whole of the Western world. And he's not just a black American intellect. He is an American intellect equal to any. W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, the party came closest to what those men wanted to stand for in the world was a fair deal for the working people of the world. We would examine it later to our sorrow. We were in an argument between not a liberator and an oppressor, but two oppressors with different techniques and methodology of oppression. In the final analysis, Russia did not want us to be free any more than in the United States and England and the imperial powers, but they wanted us under their domination. I never thought the left movement, communists or socialists, made any serious study of the history and the background of the African people of the world. And they had a preconceived notion of us that had nothing to do with our reality. And these African communal societies, who each got according to his needs, were not copied from Europe because they existed before there was a Europe. In these societies, based on the concept of the family and the community, Everyone in the society had a responsibility. And in these societies, there was no word for jail because no one had ever gone to one. No word for orphanage 
because no one had ever thrown away any children. No word for old people's home because no one had ever thrown away grandma and grandpa. And while I had some admiration for the conclusion of Karl Marx, I dare to say he was a political opportunist in the Johnny Come Lately because he was rehashing something that was in the world before the first European War shoe lived in the house that had a window. During my early years in Harlem in the 30s, my writing consisted mainly of poetry, and short stories, and little essays on aspects of history. And the Harlem Renaissance writers, of course, influenced me. Uh, I knew uh, Claude McKay. I knew Langston Hughes. I knew Richard Wright before he had published Native Son. I knew Wallace Thurman, O'Neill Larson, Jesse Fawcett. I found a Pan-Africanist consciousness in a Langston Hughes and to some degree in a Claude McKay. But the rest of them were rather parochial. Finally, I got to meet Arthur Schomburg. Arthur Schomburg, mentor to two generations of African-American scholars. The legacy of this Puerto Rican-born historian is the world's definitive institution of its kind, Harlem's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. I went down the 135th Street Library, and he was on the third floor, and I asked very humbly asked the librarian, do you know anybody who would give me a letter to see Arthur Schumburg? And she said very sharply, you know, impatiently, because she was short of help, you just have to walk up three flights. I walked up three flights, and there Arthur Schumburg was holding down the desk, being 18 and rash. I wanted to know the history of African people of the world, henceforth, right now, within the hour, his lunch hour, all of it. He said, sit down, son. What you are calling African history and Negro history are the missing pages of world history. Then he said, son, go study the history of your masters. Go study the history of the people who enslaved you and find out why they found it a necessity to remove an entire people from the respectful commentary of the history of the world. Well, my earliest impressions of them was a people in power who intended to stay in power. And I began to wonder why they had so much and other people had so little, and why everybody I knew worked harder than they. Who made this arrangement? I studied European history and world history. Now, when I went back to Schomburg with some knowledge of background of European history, now he began to show me how to study African history. Arthur Schomburg taught me the interrelationship of African history to world history. Willis and Huggins of the old Harlem History Club taught me the political meaning of history. And from the lectures of William Leo Hansberry of Howard University, I learned the philosophical meaning of history. The most valuable lesson I would learn is that when you address a people by their right name, that name must relate to land, history, and culture. All people go back to the geography of their original origin and identify themselves, no matter where they live on the face of the earth. We have overused the word black because black tells you how you look, but it don't tell you who you are. You can call an Italian white, but that don't tell you anything about him 
We are the only people who seem to have lost that all essential trait of geographical and historical reference. Around 1933 up until 1934, 1935, Harlem was main activity was how to make Harlem a congressional district so that Harlem could elect its own congressman. Adam Powell was just began to show his weight. We were fighting to get jobs on 125th Street, fighting to get jobs in our own neighborhood. I admire Adam with all of his faults. He was the best person that black America has ever sent to Washington. He got the job done. When he went to Washington the first time, they told Mr. Powell that we don't accept blacks in the congressional dining room. And Adam smiled and said, well, you don't accept them. Well, that's your custom. The next day, Adam got the tallest and the meanest looking and the blackest of the blacks he could find and marched them into the congressional dining room as his guest and got away with it. But it was a period when we were reassessing our role in the whole of the Western world. We were tuning into Africa as much as we could and having African forums and making a serious study of African history. Black men wanted to go to Ethiopia and fight on the side of the Ethiopians, but America would not get them passport and let a single one leave the country for that purpose. And yet, Italians could get passports to go and fight with Italian forces against Ethiopia. Now later, some of the same black men who couldn't get permission got permission to go fight in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade in Spain. I'm a physician. Physician? And then why would you want to go over in Ethiopia? Well, I feel it's my duty to give my profession and, if necessary, my life in the cause of Ethiopia. And I desire and be happy to die for the defense of entire Africa, including Abyssinia. That's fine. Sign right here on the dotted line. See, originally, Africans did not define themselves by continent, but more by regions. Africa as a continent began to be defined by foreigners. In North Africa, the Romans had a province called Afrique. The word became Africa. The history, both known and hidden, of the land where time began has been a primary focus of Dr. Clark's scholarship throughout his long career. The concept of social order, the concept of an organized society came out of Nile Valley civilization before there was any other society that has been known to man functioning any other place in the world. The significance of Nile Valley civilization is that it was that civilization that set a standard of performance untouched by the other civilizations of the world. And people are reluctant to give an African credit for a creation that happened in Africa. They also forget that the Nile Valley stretches 4,000 miles into the physical body of Africa, and that it was the world's first cultural highway. For centuries, Eurocentric scholars had rejected the idea that the mighty Egyptian empire was in fact created and maintained by black Africans. The concept that Western civilization was the product of non-white intelligence, imagination, technology, and spirituality was unacceptable. 
both psychologically and politically. A brilliant Senegalese scholar and scientist would shake and many say topple the very foundation of that conventional wisdom. His name was Sheikh Anta Diop. His research was brought to the attention of the English-speaking world through the efforts of his longtime colleague and friend. I was wondering why his books had never been published uh, in the United States. He said there was no publisher's interest in his books. And so it took me seven years to interest the publisher in the books of Sheikh Anta Diop. Diop's disciples refer to him as the Pharaoh of the Upper Nile. You must be strong enough and serene enough de voir les faits historiques to see the historical facts et de les and to in interpret them. Uh, nous pouvons tous être passionnés. We can all be impassioned. Mais ce n'est pas de cette manière que nous résoudrons les problèmes complexes de l'humanité. But that is now how, not how we will resolve the very complex Donc, problems of humanity. Donc cette domination dont nous souffrons, dont j'ai souffert moi-même. The domination that we suffer from, that I have suffered from myself. Notre propre domination des autres races l'a précédé. Our domination of other races preceded it. Donc l'Afrique a exercé un impérialisme continu pendant 4000 ans. For 4,000 years, black Africa had an imperialism. Toute l'Asie occidentale était conquise et était justement sous la domination noire. All of Western Asia was under the, domin under the domination of blacks. On n'aurait pu jamais penser à cette époque-là que la situation pourrait un jour être renversée. And at that time, <laughs> no one would ever have dreamt that the situation could be reversed. C'est pour ça que l'étude de l'histoire, l'étude de l'histoire, nous redonne la sérénité pour this apprécier is, les faits et les relativiser. This is why the study of history gives us the serenity required to appreciate the facts as they are. 1974, he would challenge the major scholars of the world on the concept of Egypt not being anything other than an African state. In the conference on the peopling of Egypt, leading scholars of the world met and debated. Most of them wanted to put Egypt's origin outside of Africa. Sheikh Antetio and his protege, Theophil Obenga, placed Egypt within the context of Africa's totality. Sheikh Antetio was more than a historian, he was a scientist, he was a paleontologist, and he had proven that if he could get the pigment from some of the mummies, he could prove the African origins. All the rest of the conferees came just to disagree. And when it was all over, they had to admit these two men came prepared to prove their case. At that point, they began to close the door to the research of Sheikh and Adio. From the first dynasty, to the invasion of Nile Valley, that was the first golden age. And from the third dynasty came the great multi-genius, M. Hotel, the real father of medicine, who lived 1,800 years before the Greek who's called the father of medicine. And when we read the biography of the Greek, he says, I am a child of M. Hotel. And from the 18th dynasty came the world's great social reformer and maybe one of the world's first deities, Akhenaten. He thought so much of life he would not crush a flower. He outlawed warfare. Spirituality was a part of the total life of the people. Before the coming of the Europeans, the African was very religious. The Step Pure Me was originally built for the temple at the top where you can go up and pray. This relates not just to the glorification of a pharaoh, but the spiritual outpouring of a people. This is what made the civilization of the Nile so great. At the same time that Egypt was in its 24th dynasty, Europe was just emerging from its preliterate past. The first show of European intelligence was a book called The Artists in the Iliad. That's about 850 B.C. Where is Egypt 850 B.C.? 
Egypt is old and tired and has gone through 24 dynasties. 